Hello and welcome to part two of our Art of the Storyteller series. <laughs> Mine, or ours, or everybody's, I don't care which one. Um, hope you guys have all had a great week, it's good to see you all again. Um, thank you for the improving support, our group is growing by the week, by the day, by the everything. And it's going, everything is going very well, I'm hearing lots of very positive feedback about my work and that of others. A special hi to all the all those guys who we're working with, especially to try and bring along other people's work and give the little bits of knowledge I've picked up along the way to other people. And I'm glad I'm actually helping to inspire some people along the way. That's the whole idea of what I'm doing here. We've got no special visitors this week. The girls are all awake and with their mum at the moment. So let's get started on part two, which is that of location. And as you know, location is a very important part of any story, where it takes place, how it takes place, how that influences the characters, it feeds directly on from our characterization from last week. That where you put your character totally depends on how that character reacts, develops, and changes. Now in mine so far, we've, as an example, we've had most of the location my character take place on the move, traveling, as moving as part of the army from one side of the world to the other. But of course, we do have a couple of very specific locations. Obviously the first one that I mentioned that all of my characters have and are present in is the, the chambers of the dwarves and the dragons, or the dragon, should I say, underneath Mount Everest in modern day Tibet in the Himalayas. Why did I choose Mount Everest? Well, throughout cultures and throughout history and throughout many different periods of history in the world, Mount Everest and its variety of different names and significances have held a very specific and special mythic understanding for that place. It's had a lot of legends written about it. It's been called the, the center of the world, the navel of the world, a place where great things happen and go on. And also it's been a period of great and important significance throughout history. And it was a thought of mine and it occurred to me when I was trying to figure out about how I was going to make Alexander and his soldiers immortal and change. And the usual things have all been done, haven't they? The mythical gods, the great powerful artifacts, the strange occurrences, vampires, gods, angels, demons, all that sort of thing. It's been done already. And of course in my books, if you've read through them, there are other beings in there of less certain inherited longevity in their being. You know, we have the Trinity, we have Kalanos, who nobody knows exactly what he is, and he's not the only one. There are others who make walk-on cameo style appearances in my books who we don't know who they are or how they became immortal or where they came from. Kalanos, nobody knows who he is, I do, but you'll find out later who he is. You'll find out what he is later on. But it's coming, it'll be an interesting one. We also use Mount Everest and the chambers of the dwarves and the dragon underneath Mount Everest as a way of defining the characteristics and the mindset and the beliefs of different characters because you may have noticed through the short stories and through the novellas I have presented the chambers of the dragon from the perspective of different characters. It initially was shown from the perspective of Kaliadis during the, the you know from during the stories of the Ten Thousand and the Dragon of Macedon which appeared in my first two short story collections, Kaliadis describes that chamber and his transformation in a certain way. But you may notice Kaliadis pays a lot more attention, seeing as he is a, the archetypal soldier, he describes that location from a soldier's point of view. Later on we see Lupinikis when he goes in there during the Victory of Wolves, his novella, he describes it in a much more a much more philosophical and artistic fashion. He is taken by in by the details and the and the beauty in the art more than the being scared half to death like Kaliadis is. Um, 
And then we see finally in Son of the Dragon, and in addition, somewhat in the Charmer of Snakes, how both Sham and Alexander react. And we see a lot differently, that we see that Alexander very strongly contrasts the chamber of her, the dragon, with the other chamber that he locates on this strange alien place at the end of the desert he ends up in. And it is interesting to be, but sometimes to use one location to contrast it with another. I very intentionally made the chambers that Alexander discovers by himself a copy or an almost exact replica. A dark flip side of the dragon's chambers. And as you may notice, the dragon's chamber and everything about it, every little tiny little detail that you may have missed or that you have imagined and added in as you've read has some very serious and important influences on the actual story itself and the characters. You'll see how their mindset is changed before they even meet the dragon herself and the events which take place in that very unexpected dwarven city underneath Mount Everest in the middle of our very human world. There is that huge, I suppose, fantasy element of two fantastical creatures, the, the dwarves of legend, the miners, the metal workers, and everything that is associated with dwarves and an actual dragon, the last dragon in existence. Hidden away in plain sight, but not seen by people because of the location. That's why I picked Mount Everest, because back in the day of Alexander, very few people went there. Even in our modern age, not many people go there, and if they do, they're just passing through. They wouldn't think about exploring the details of Mount Everest, they're just thinking about getting to the top, or as close to as they can. And that's one location. Now, obviously, you know there are other locations in the stories. There are the Kalshadar spacecraft, there's the Dragon's Crown of Alexander, there are bits of the modern and the, and the historic world. And these are mentioned in passing because though my characters are actually taking... Take, the, the adventures of my characters are taking place in those locations my stories are more about the story and the characters themselves. How they, you may notice when they're passing through other countries and other nations, most of the time they don't even know where they are and that, to some degree, though some people might say it's lazy writing, no it's not. Because for a common everyday soldier, passing through an unknown land, they don't know what that land is called unless somebody tells them. In that period of history, from, for, my Macedonians and my Greeks, everywhere they go to is new. Everything they travel to east of the west of the Mediterranean is unknown territory, it's legendary stuff. It's the, the writings of people like Herodontus and people like that who people those lands with fantastical beasts like giant elephants and mammoths and dragons and chimera and basilisks and unicorns. They didn't find any of that stuff though because it didn't really exist. Now, of course, you could say, oh, you're being all scientific and dismissing myth. Well, I've got dragons and dwarves. So what kind of myths am I dismissing here? And there are, pe there are immortal people traveling across the world, big giants in fancy armor. How am I being overly scientific here? Now, of course, we have other locations, and you can also see how I've mentioned those. That we've got the Dragon's Nest, the Kalshadar base underneath London or London as it's called, and we'll get back to that part later. I'm going to blend in something else as part of it, and I'll expand that a little bit further next week, by the way. We also have the moon itself, and how different people react to it. You know, the moon I use that, and the moon base I use that for quite another contrasting and plot piece kind of usage. The, the moon base is just a place and a place of interest and discovery for my Cal Shadar characters, and Alexander never really specifically turns up there, though he does. And I also use how Sham and Gabriel react to that moon base. You know, one of my favorite parts in, the, in Sham's earlier story arc, 
or at least his Trinity story arc, is the image of Sham sat on the lip of a crater on the Sea of Tranquility, smoking a cigar, with no spacesuit and his cigarette smoke drifting out of his protective bubble, just like it's the most normal thing in the world. But I do that intentionally in order to have to, add, to give that sort of fantastical element. Take something everyday and normal and put it in some location where such a thing doesn't happen. But it does. And it sets the tone, gives the idea, turns things around in such a way that immediately it puts the reader's mind in a certain way of thinking. They imagine this middle-aged Indian man with long hair smoking a cigar without a spacesuit on the moon while other two other people follow him similarly unspacesuited similarly protected by bubbles and they discover the great conspiracy theory a real city on the moon and i do something quite intentional that sit in the moon that the calcidar and the dwarves repurpose and use having discovered fantastical technology on the moon I do the thing that nobody knows, not even that the oldest trinity himself, Sham, not even the council know who built that city. The dragon doesn't know, the dwarves don't know, nobody knows. This, that city on the moon is older than civilization on earth, older than the human race itself. It's the great mystery, yet somehow they find upon the moon the technology that they can use just by chance, thanks to a form of standard notation the dwarves developed with Einstein, Tesla and other people, and the great thinkers of history. They develop a form of binary code which enables them to decode the databases they find on the computers on the moon, and to be able to create all of their technology and send human technology leaping forward by centuries or at least that happens until they leave you know they keep the best for themselves and for the arcs that Lupa Nike sends out into the stars but the council they can't let have that technology and it's one of those things one of those moral conflicts that they have in there that suddenly this great technology that can improve human civilization beyond belief is censored it is held back, it is hidden because they don't want the council to have it because the council will abuse it but are oh, the Kaushada is Lupa Nikes, is the hegemony abusing their power by holding back that technology are they behaving in a way just like the council would behave so you see how locations and how location affects the story also <coughs> excuse me, I have a bit of a cold there, I apologize. How it affects the people, and it affects the story. So, you have to see how it all connects and works together, and how location and technology and everything are linked in. And of course, here's the other part I wanted to talk about, related to location. Because the history of my world is changed, because Alexander the Great does not die, and everything that would have followed his death did not happen. The Roman Empire, modern Western civilization as we know it. Modern Egyptian, modern, all of its civilization never happened. The United States of America didn't become what it was gonna become. How languages are changed. How culture and thought is different. It all ties into our location. Because our location, in the widest possible sense, is a world that never came to be of a world that is so different from our own, everything is different. And I started discovering that when I decided to include people like Einstein in my stories as him being, you needed somebody human, somebody mortal, somebody a great and brilliant scientific mind like him and the great enigma of the 20th century or the 19th century Nikola Tesla to be there to provide that inspiration and that creativity and that way out there scientific understanding 
to make those discoveries possible. So by using that location to its best potential, I also had to think about things such as language and culture and change. You know, Albert Einstein is German, but because the Roman Empire never happened, the German tribes were not pacified and Romanized in the way they would have been. So they remained the Teutonic and the Gothic tribes as they would have been. They formed their Teutonic and Gothic nations and in my interpretation, the Goths achieved supremacy and therefore Einstein was not Albert Einstein, the German, but Albrecht Einstein, the Gothlander, which is a little bit more interesting. And Nikola Tesla is not and Nikola Tesla is not a Slavic Czechoslovakian. There's slight differences there. As you know that in on the in history so it had me have to dig around and research and study languages which I love already and history and social and cultural change which I found to be a great and interesting challenge but it made me change everything I you know in fact there's a joke or something I found funny that I wrote to Dr Stephen Hawking this week because he's still alive he's a public figure and I wanted to have him allow me just to look up the email that I sent to him because I I decided it's one of those difficult things isn't it when you're using a real world person in your books someone who's still alive or may be recently dead that do you ask for their permission or not you know here's the interesting thing you know I I I decided I was going to request from Dr Hawking that I could, if I could use him in my book, if I could ask him for his permission for to appear him, I suppose, in my stories. And I'm sorry, I'm just trying to find the email. So bear with me one second. So I tried to do that and I realized in my world, he wouldn't be Dr. Stephen Hawking, he'd be Dr. Stefan Holwech, as in that would be my change from Celtic, Gothic, Saxon, and everything. I know I'll spell that for you later. Um, he would still exist, but the England, as we know it, Britain of my birth, or my at least I grew up in Britain and Ireland. Those great, uh, interesting, and fascinatingly legendary islands of history remain Celtic. Britain became Albion. And the Calcidar decided to bury their, sit, their, their base under London rather than London or Alexandria upon Thames as it's officially known in the hegemony because it was the last place people would think of looking. It's where, as they say, excuse my French or excuse my Breton as it would have been as the arse end of the hegemony. Place, the place, the last place people would think of looking. And of course, I mention it in, a, in an article I'm putting up about why I chose the hegemony, how different the world is. Because location and culture have a big thing. We also have the Native Americans were never conquered and they formed their own nations. They have the, the, the federated nations of the people instead of the United States of America. All the tribes got together and decided to go on a rotating period of prevalence or primacy for each tribe. Currently the Navajo in our modern world are the ones who are in governance and it is a Navajo astronaut who lands on the moon and has his encounter with Nesha and Kaliadis as they make fun of him in some degree and ask him to leave. The Shoshone primacy is coming up soon and it's all linked together because in our short story the council Martin Castlebank is spirited away by Sham from Shoshone territory outside of the hegemony where Ataraxias thinks he's going to be safe <coughs> but he is not and we'll get into more detail about it later but to simmer it down location is a lot more important than most people think where you decide to put things, how you decide to determine that location, how you decide to make that location be, is going to have a huge, huge, huge influence 
on the rest of your story. What locations, what places, what things you decide to use are going to have a huge, huge influence. And I discovered in mine that the location I chose led to a lot more work than I thought it was ever going to be. But it caused huge developments, huge story arcs and huge interesting parts that I would not have imagined possible. Because let's say one final thing of location in history, one final location we mentioned, we've mentioned Alexandria in passing. Let's almost also mention Jerusalem. But it's one thing that's caused controversy in my stories a little bit, and I think it's important. Obviously, with the failure of the Roman Empire to exist, one very important historical figure, which some people argue about the existence of, or who he was, or what he did, called Jesus Christ in our time, called Yeshua ben Yoshua, or Yeshua the Christoman, in my time, <coughs> doesn't meet Pontius Pilate as he does in the Bible he meets Alexander the hegemon and it leads to a lot of different story and a lot of different story twists and turns and matters of interest that I hadn't previously planned in creating but it naturally by itself osmotically formed and suddenly I had the reason for Alexander's disappearance once Jesus is murdered and he chances upon Jesus in his final moments. It brings about major story shifts in my arc, which I hadn't actually planned. It led to the creation of the novellas and it led to making a part of the story that I've been, I've been, I've been struggling with for years to suddenly make sense. So now you see a location might just be a place to many people, but to a writer, a location is vital. If you pick the wrong, if you pick one location, your story will go in one direction. If you pick a different location, it will go in another. And I discovered that as soon as I started to add more locations, my story developed a texture, a richness, a depth that I hadn't even imagined. And suddenly, characters I had that I thought were going to be certain things became something else. And stories that I got stuck with suddenly linked together and made sense. It was once I started playing with locations that suddenly all of my other bits and pieces of story, all my short stories, all my everything that I had created gelled together and formed a coherent whole, formed a hegemony from 323 BC onwards until I think about 2000 or so years into our future when Alexander returns or when novels are going to begin or at least a hegemony series of novels are going to begin suddenly it had complete and utter sense I had a story arc that followed osmotically and simply and easily or because of the locations that I chose. So when you choose your locations in your stories, think about it. Think really hard about the story you're wanting to write, the characters you're going to want to write, how they you want them to develop, and pick the location that helps them do that. Or if you're going to do what I what is popularly called pantsing, in the terms of uh, was it NaRimo or National Writing which passed, which we're still in, and good luck with the people who are taking part in that, by the way, you're almost done, you're almost there, you've got four days left, five, <laughs> that as a pantser like I am, my story, you've got to be careful your story doesn't get out of your control and go completely crazy out there, like mine almost did, when you pick a location and realise that suddenly You've either got to go back and retrofit everything, rewrite major tracks of text from early like I did, or find a way to make it fit into your continuity in your universe, as I've had to do as well. It's been fun, and I've still got more work to do. Starting next year, I'm beginning a major project of rewriting large chunks of my text so it all fits and it makes sense. And bits that I've learned, you know, me 
the creator of this world had learned things about my world I, the one who invented it, didn't know. Think about that. It makes things a lot more complicated. Anyway, time is running out. I'm almost at half an hour. It's probably a lot longer than a lot of people want to see, but these are workshops here. Get involved. Come back to me. Respond to me. Give me answers. Don't just read it, click it, and like it. Give me feedback. Give me your feedback. Group. We're a group here. Give me some feedback. Don't have me being the only poster on our group. We've got people out there. Joe, get your finger out and write some great stuff because I know you've got that potential in you, man. I have faith in you. All of you who are joining the Ink Slingers Retreat and Wordsmiths Warren, it's a bit of a mouthful, I realize now I come to say it on video. Come on, engage, get involved. Tell me I'm wrong. I am not an untouchable fearless leader I am a writer like you learning as I go along but also take my experience and what I've learned and use me ask me questions I know things I have mysterious knowledge <laughs> no I don't I just know a few things and I've learned a few things along the way but anyway you guys thank you I love you all I have enjoyed I all enjoyed this as I always do speaking to you all in your silent responses and you guys have a fantastic week. We will be back next week with part three of our storyteller's journey into the realm of language and how that affects our writing. Whether we have created languages, whether we create languages, where we just create words, slang, swear words and insults, how that makes its changes to our world too. Till next week guys, it's been a pleasure, I'll see you guys later. Take care, love you all, bye bye.